Well, now that we have some familiarity with our most important star, the Sun, it's time to extrapolate and investigate the characteristics of the other stars. Things like their distance, their brightness or luminosity, also the magnitude, their classification, how we classify them compared to other stars, their color, and other features that are important in astronomy. So how do we determine the distance of the stars? Well, the most direct method is by means of parallax or trigonometric parallax because it uses basic trig to figure this out. It turns out as the Earth goes around the Sun, the distance from Sun to Earth is one astronomical unit. And because of the different vantage points of Earth, a star, here's a nearby star, will be seen in a certain position in January and then six months later, as it arcs around the sun, 93 million miles away from the sun, this different position in July, that star will look like it's in a different place in the sky. And there's a certain angle through which the position of this star seems to migrate. So if we look at this basic triangle, the parallax angle is this angle here. If you go from sun to star to earth, this is the parallax angle. And those angles are actually very small. But what you can see by the geometry here is that if, you're, if the star is really close, then this parallax angle is larger. So the closer the object is, the greater that angle is as well. Okay, so that's a very clearly seen phenomena there. The stars themselves are all so far away that even though this huge uh, opposite end of the triangle here, Earth to Sun, one astronomical unit. That 93 million miles is very small in comparison to the distance to the stars. So this angle is really small. In other words, this side of the triangle is very small compared to these other two sides, such that all the stars have less than one arc second of parallax, which is an angle equivalent to the angle of a period at the other end of a football field, as we've discussed in the past. Well, the distance to an object with a parallax angle of one arc second, if this is one arc second, that tiny angle, then the distance to this object would be one parsec. That's how it's defined. So there's a formula. Distance is one over p. You may not see how that comes out of that, this discussion, but it's a very simple formula is in parsecs, that's the distance, and this is the parallax angle in arc seconds. It turns out that one parsec is 3.26 light years, which just means that the nearby object, if it's going to be far enough away so that this angle is that tiny one arc second, then by definition that object is at one parsec. I'll put the laser beam here so you aren't confused. So let's say that this is one parsec, then this angle is one arc second. And that distance then would have to be 3.26 light years. So a parsec is simply a consequence of the size of the Earth's orbit. It's the size of this end of the triangle. So now we can use this formula to determine the distance to, for instance, the nearest star Alpha Centauri. We discover that by measuring its parallax that the angle is 0.76 arc seconds. Well then, just plug in d is 1 over p, it's 1.3 parsecs. Multiply that by 3.26 and you get 4.3 light years. Turns out that with ground telescopes, we can only detect parallax out to about 100 parsecs, corresponding to 1 one hundredth of an arc second. That's an extremely tiny angle, obviously. But even with that tiny, tiny angle that we have the ability to measure, we can still only get a few hundred light years into the galaxy in terms of measuring the distance to stars. But the nearest stars have been discovered with this direct measurement technique. Something that is still in common use is what's known as the magnitude of stars or the magnitude scale introduced by Hipparchus, the ancient Greek, back a long time ago, where he defined the brightest stars to be first magnitude and the faintest stars visible with the unaided eye as being sixth magnitude. 
Now, currently, we have a more quantitative way to consider this, which is that first magnitude stars are 100 times brighter than sixth magnitude stars. So first magnitude, essentially, approximately, the brightest stars in the sky. Sixth magnitude, the dimmest stars in the sky that we can see. Well, if first and sixth, there's a factor of 100 difference, then one magnitude is a factor of 2.512. And it turns out that the larger numbers correspond to fainter stars. So sixth magnitude is the faintest stars, again, with the unaided eye. So if there are six magnitudes, first to six, that means there's five gaps. One, two, three, four, five, six, you'll notice five gaps. So each gap corresponds to a factor. And again, it turns out that that factor is 2.512, which is really the fifth root of 100, if you're interested in the math. And you could also say then that 2.512 to the fifth power, or if you multiply this factor five times, that gives you 100. So that's the span of intensity difference between the magnitudes from 1 to 6. So then we distinguish apparent magnitude and absolute magnitude. Apparent magnitude is really simply just how bright the star appears from Earth, and it's a number corresponding to that. Well, to make it quantitative, since the stars all have different brightnesses, we assign the brightness of Vega, which is a very bright star, being zero. So the apparent brightness of Vega, the apparent magnitude is zero then the brighter the star appears, the smaller the magnitude gets. So, in principle, this is what we're doing. We have two stars here. Obviously, one is brighter than the other on this screen. This one is dimmer, therefore it has a larger magnitude. It's more positive, whereas this brighter star has a smaller magnitude, which means it's more negative. Now, that seems to defy common sense, but keep in mind that it's based on the first magnitude being the brightest, sixth magnitude being dimmest. So if you just think, when you discuss magnitudes, to consider it in the opposite way that common sense would direct you, you will probably be right. So think opposite common sense, namely that dimmer is larger magnitude, brighter, smaller magnitude, and you will be on the right track. Considering different objects that are familiar in the apparent magnitude scale, we have very bright objects being in the negative part of the apparent magnitude spectrum, and very dim objects being in the, in the, on the right side here, positive numbers. The Hubble Space Telescope can view objects so dim that their apparent magnitude is in the upper 20s. Well, some more familiar examples, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky here. With Vega being uh, an apparent magnitude of zero, Sirius is minus 1.42. So it's over a magnitude brighter than Sirius. The full moon is minus 12 and a half. The sun is minus 26 and a half. The, certainly the winner for the brightest star in the sky. And now absolute magnitude is similar to apparent magnitude, except that it has a reference distance. So you're comparing apples and apples. In other words, with apparent magnitude, if you, you, you see how bright an object appears, but it doesn't tell you how far away it is. So the full moon is very bright. But if you put it as far away as a star, you wouldn't even see it. So its apparent magnitude has a lot to do with distance. So to make accurate comparisons between two objects, we set the distance to be the same, and the distance chosen is 10 parsecs. So it allows us to make accurate comparisons between objects, setting them the same distance apart from each other. So here's the idea. Observer, looking at two objects the same distance away. The dimmer object has a larger absolute magnitude. The brighter object has a smaller or more negative absolute magnitude. So that's how the magnitude scales work, apparent and absolute. Absolute gives you the intrinsic brightness, the actual luminosity of the object. The apparent magnitude is a measure of how bright it appears.
Well, the luminosity of stars is such an important concept, so I belabor the point a bit. Again, the luminosity is the actual brightness of the star, whereas the apparent brightness is how bright it appears. So here we show a star in the center of spheres, and this first sphere is one astronomical unit in radius, or distance from the star, and just showing some of the light from the star passing through this region at one astronomical unit. There's a certain amount of energy that passes through there. Well, if we go to two astronomical units, we double the distance. By doubling the distance, we've doubled the width and the height through which that same quantity of light is now passing through. So you've quadrupled the area. Two times two is four. At three astronomical units, three times three is nine. You have nine times the area. What is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is if the same light goes through greater area, then it dims. It gets less intense. Here it's one-fourth the intensity is here. And here it's only one-ninth the intensity because the area has gone up by a factor of nine. So I've really just described for you what's known as the inverse square law. A very important law in science, in astronomy in particular. Nature uses the inverse square law all the time. And it just says that the, in this case, the apparent brightness decreases inversely with the square of the distance between the source and observer. Decreasing inversely just means that if one thing goes up, the other goes down. So as the distance goes up, the brightness, the apparent brightness, the intensity goes down. Now that has a special name given to it. It's called flux. The apparent brightness is really the flux. It's the power per area. So how much power is going through a particular area? Obviously, it's nine times, well, it's four times here what it is here, and it's nine times the power per area here that it is here from what we just described. So a little more detail on that. The luminosity can be quantified with this formula. Basically, the surface area, the area through which it's passing, the luminosity, times a constant times temperature to the fourth power. So that's the brightness, the intrinsic brightness. It's kind of related to the intrinsic or absolute magnitude. The apparent brightness or flux, that's basically a measure of the apparent magnitude. And it's just taking the luminosity and dividing it by the area. That gives you the flux, power or luminosity divided by area. So the flux ends up just being this constant times t to the fourth power. The t to the fourth power is really important because it shows how incredibly dependent the flux is on temperature. We encountered that in the previous unit. So in summary, luminosity is the total power of the object emitting the light. The apparent brightness, well, that is really how much power you have divided by the surface area through which it passes, and that is what we call flux. These intrinsic and apparent magnitudes relate to the distance to the stars, which is part of the context of our discussion here. There is a formula known as the distance modulus equation. You'll appreciate it a lot. <clears throat> Here's the formula. M minus M, apparent minus absolute magnitude is minus 5 plus 5 log base 10 of the distance. I'm sure you feel very warm and fuzzy about that little equation. Well, let me just show you what these various things are again. So M is absolute magnitude. So it's just a measure of the brightness of this star here. Notice it's radiating out. The further away we go from this star, the less power per area, the less flux we have, which again is a measure of the apparent magnitude. The apparent magnitude is what an observer receives, a certain amount of energy getting into your eyeball the pupil of your eye every second per meter squared or power per area. Well then if you know those two things the difference between those two magnitudes is called the distance modulus and it's in the formula right above. Now if you solve this equation for d it turns out you get this 10 to the power this whole thing and minus m plus 5 quantity divided by 5 in parsecs. So 
don't worry about how we get that equation, but these particular characteristics, these physical quantities are obtainable and you can actually get the distance to the star in parsec. So that's pretty cool. If we know a star's absolute magnitude, that's the key. How bright is that star really? If you know that, you can infer how far away the star is by knowing its apparent magnitude, which you can always get because the apparent magnitude is how bright it appears. And when, with our technology on Earth, we look at the star and count the photons and can get a very accurate measure of the apparent magnitude. So this is a very foundational equation in astronomy used all the time, which is why I introduced it to you. And also to recognize that the ideas of apparent and absolute magnitude are based on the inverse square law idea, where when you double the distance, the intensity goes down by a factor of four. All that's embedded in these ideas we just discussed. It is now time to consider how we classify the stars. And a fundamental way in which we do that is based on their color or temperature, it turns out. Here's an image, a Hubble image of stars in the Milky Way. And you can see the significant variety of colors there of the various stars. Well, the color turns out to be a direct consequence of the temperature. And in fact, then, the temperature is revealed by the color. So if we can understand what the color is, it tells us what the temperature is. But the temperature is what determines the color. Sounds a little circular, but we use that information to determine the temperature of the star. So stars are classified according to their spectra. The spectra, again, is simply a measurement of the various intensities at different wavelengths. So the spectra, this curve here, is very different for different temperature stars, as we've looked at already. And that classification, which is based on temperature, is as follows by our human convention. And there is a mnemonic associated with the various letters corresponding to different spectral classifications. And it's O-B-A-F-G-K-M. And traditionally, the mnemonic is O, oh, be a fine girl or guy, kiss me. To be gender neutral, I typically modify that and say, oh, be a fine gremlin, kiss me. But you can use whatever you want. So this is the spectral classification of stars based on their temperature. Notice a decreasing temperature as we go from O all the way on through M. From hot to cooler stars. That's how the spectral classification system works. And it's all based on the temperature, which then also is a somewhat indirect measure of the color.